The three most popular religions of our day, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, are what we call a monotheistic religion, meaning all three worship only one God and they deny the existence of any other gods. But the relationship between those three faiths is even more closely related than that. Did you know that they also claim to worship the same God? It's true. Judaism calls God Yahweh, and both Christianity and Islam refer to God as God. In Arabic, Allah means God. In fact, all three religions have a closer tie than even that. All three trace their start to the same person, Abraham, who in the book of Genesis had the very first close, intimate, personal relationship with God. Judaism and Christianity both claim that they come from Abraham's descendant, Isaac, and Islam traces their history back to the first son, Ishmael. But what about before Abraham? Well, before Abraham, all three faiths line up. They're all unified up to that moment, all the way back to Adam, who is the first human being. Each of the three religions tells the story of Adam. They honor him as their first person, and they center key theological statements about God, creation, humanity, through that Genesis story. So, in summary, all three faiths say that there is one God, it all began with Adam, and that Abraham is the father of their faith. So who was Abraham? <laughs> and what made him so special? Why single him out, and why talk about him today as a example of faith? Because aside from Moses, there really isn't any other Old Testament character that's more mentioned in the New Testament than Abraham. James even refers to Abraham as God's friend. That's a title that wasn't given to anybody else. In fact, the book of Galatians says that we are all, Gentiles included, we are all children of Abraham. So Abraham's importance and his impact on religious history is clearly seen in the Bible. So again, who is he? Abraham's story takes up a big portion of scripture. He's got 14 chapters in the book of Genesis that talk about his life. And we know a lot about his life, we do, but we don't know very much about his early life before he was called. Because by the time uh, God calls Abraham, Abraham's already 75. Probably the most famous aspect of his story is his calling. It's the passage we remember the most. Genesis 12, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Today, we are in a study of Romans. We've been in a study of Romans for a few weeks now. So why are we talking about Abraham? Well, here we are, Romans chapter 4. Paul is going through uh, this book, and he is going to call his first witness. We've been saying that throughout our study, Paul is a Hebrew lawyer, and he's writing this document to present his case. He is trying to answer the critics of the faith, he is trying to reassure new converts of Judaism. He is trying to systematically spell out what it is that Christians believe. Romans is a very good book to read when you want to learn what it is that Christians believe. And now here we are in Romans chapter 4, and kind of a hush falls over the courtroom, and Paul brings in his first witness, the great grandfather of faith, Abraham. Verse 1 says, 
What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Here is what we know about Abraham. Abraham was born in 1996. BC. <laughs> he lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldeans, or was uh, southern east Iraq. It's where we would say uh, Nasiria is. Ironically, very close to where historically we believe the Garden of Eden was. But that long ago, it's very unlikely that anybody in that part of the world would have known who God was. God had not revealed himself uh, to humanity. But then, out of the blue, God reveals himself to Abram, and Abram travels all the way to Israel, what would be the promised land. Does Abraham have a wife? Yes, uh, his wife Sarai. She, she's named that first, and later in the story, her name changes to Sarah, and the two of them have no kids. And this is a point in the story that comes up. It is a matter of contention because, well, for one, as a Hebrew, Having children or having a large family is a blessing. It's the goal for any couple. A Hebrew saying is, with a child in the house, all the corners are full. Another saying is, having only one child is like having only one eye. For another reason, well, God had just told Abram in his promise that he would be the father of a great nation. So where are all these children? Not to mention that Abraham and Sarah are both way past their prime. So why does Paul put Abraham on the stand? Because Paul has been talking about faith, he's been talking about works, he's been talking about grace, and now Paul wants to highlight a very specific attribute of faith. And he says this aspect exists in Abraham. And he quotes Genesis 15, 6. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So why is that important and what does that mean? What does it mean to have something credited to him as righteousness? Well, we're in the story of the Bible. And by the time you get to Abraham, you're really not that far into it. Uh, this is a big story. But the big story before this story is our birth parents, it's Adam and Eve. So there's the Adam and Eve story, and then there's this. God also speaks to Adam and Eve. God also gives them a promise, gives them instructions. Do Adam and Eve believe the Lord? No. In their story, they believed a snake. And so if we pretend that sin and salvation are on this giant scale, right? Adam and Eve have tipped us into the red. We're now like at negative 100. It's the bottom of the ninth. Things don't look good. Abraham steps up to the plate and Genesis says that his belief is credited to him as righteousness. In other words, where Adam and Eve did not believe, Abraham believed God's word. And the Bible says that was a credit towards righteousness, meaning the scale, if it's tipped downward, now tips back. It tips back towards peace, or what the Hebrews would say is unity with God, which would be shalom. Paul says in Romans verse 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. So again, he goes back. Are we saved by works? Are we saved by the law? Paul argues 
It cannot be. Why not, Paul? Because the Bible says Abraham was righteous before there was a law, before there was circumcision, before there was the Ten Commandments, before there was baptism, before there was a written gospel. And I'm sure by now that, that Paul writes these words, there's plenty of other heroes and heroines who've obeyed God in the Old Testament. Paul could have used any one of those. Why does he then put Abraham on the stand? Lots of people believed God. That's true. But Abraham and Sarah not only believed God, they believed the impossible. Abraham is 99. Sarah is 89 when they have a family. This is why Paul calls Abraham to the stand. Paul uses Abraham to show us the power of believing in God's promises. Now, does that mean that Abraham and Sarah were perfect? They never doubted. They had this otherworldly, superhuman faith. They never made mistakes. They were perfect believers. No, not at all. And, and this is one of the things I love about the Bible. When the Bible shows us our heroes and heroines, it leaves all the mistakes and the doubt and the brokenness in. It shows us the reality and the truth of their humanity. Now, what was the mistake that Abraham and Sarah make? Their mistake was they were impatient. Rather than wait for God's timing, they forced the plan. Sarah gives her servant Hagar to her husband as a concubine so that Abraham can have a son through Hagar. And then Sarah says, you know, after the child is born, the, the child will be ours. Now, today, in 2023, this seems backwards and barbaric. We can't understand this practice. But this event takes place 2,000 years before Jesus. So culturally, back then, this was acceptable as a way to just have more kids. And we can't also blame Sarah for this. We cannot. She, for one, she's not getting any younger, right? And two, we've all been there, tapping our foot, impatient, wondering, God, are you up there? Do you hear my prayers? It seems like you're answering everybody else's prayer. Everybody else is being blessed. And here I sit, day after day, now year after year. Where's my fortune? Where's, where's my happily ever after, God? So it's probably no big surprise that this plan of theirs doesn't go very well. Sarah is not happy when Hagar has a child. In fact, it probably made things worse. Sarah becomes jealous and resentful. And Hagar's child probably adds more to her feelings of just worthlessness. Uh, Sarah begins to mistreat Hagar. Hagar grabs the baby and runs away. God pursues Hagar and tells her, come back. Go back to Abraham. Uh, they, they, will, they will raise the child correctly, and, and your son will also be the father of a nation. Paul says next in verse 16, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Abraham's testimony proves the point that Paul has been making all the way up until now, to the point we get here in chapter 4, and that is Abraham had faith and he acted on that faith. And that acting was credited to him as righteousness. When he and Sarah tried to make the blessing happen through their work and through their own power, basically not, not trusting, that didn't go well. In another part of the Bible, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he says in chapter 4, as a prisoner for the Lord, Paul's talking about himself, he's a prisoner, he's in jail, he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Paul says, live a life worthy of 
your calling? Well, he must be talking to pastors, right? He's got to be talking to church leaders. It's priests who say they feel a calling of the Lord. It's missionaries who say they feel a calling on the Lord. That's who Paul's talking to, right? No. Paul is talking to every single one of us. Because you see, just like Abraham was a normal person, an average guy, just like us, we have also been called. Every Christian has been called. Romans 11 says, For the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. Romans 8 says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And there's another great reason to use Abraham right now as a witness. Because just like Abraham, we too are called by God And that calling forces us to change direction. Just as God called Abraham to go on a journey, to travel to an unfamiliar place, to become a stranger in a strange land, we too are called to follow. God called Abraham. Abraham stepped out out in faith. Was it easy? No, it wasn't easy. Abraham and Sarah made mistakes but they believed the promise. God said, I will bless you and I will bless the world through you. You read the story and you wonder, you're like, out of all the people, nobody had a relationship with God yet. God yet hadn't revealed himself to anyone. Why did God choose Abraham? I mean, what was so special about him? I mean, Abraham didn't come from a prominent family. Abraham's parents were probably pagans. They probably worshipped idols. As far as we know, Abraham's just an ordinary person leading an ordinary life. So obviously God saw something in Abraham that made him different. Perhaps God called him because he knew how Abraham would respond. God called and Abraham had faith. In fact, Abraham had the type of faith that believed in the power of God's promises, even when the road ahead looks impossible. And that faith changed his direction. And it's that same faith that we have that changes ours. Verse 21, Paul writes, "...fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised." That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It'll be counted to us who believed in him, who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Paul says this is written down, not just for his sake, but for ours also. Abraham had a calling, and a promise. Do we? Yes. We have a promise. What's our promise? Our promise is John 3, 16, right? It's the, it's the verse we teach everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Is there power in believing that promise? Yes. Abraham believes And and God says, I'm going to do the impossible. You're going to inherit an unseen land, and in your old age, you are going to be the parent of a nation. Impossible, physically impossible. But when we trust in our promise, John 3, 16, we are also believing in something that is physically impossible. Namely, eternal life. And like Abraham in his belief, the Christian does the same thing. The Christian picks up their pack and they set out on a new road. Their life was one way. They receive that, uh, they receive that promise and they change direction. We change direction. Because a, a Christian isn't just somebody who believes Jesus lived or who says, you know, Jesus was a good person. John 3.16 says, 
you have faith in Jesus as the Son of God and that that Son of God was given for the world. And that promise is eternal life. Paul makes a point and says, Abraham didn't just believe, he was fully convinced, Abraham says. It's one thing to say, I believe that tightrope will hold me. It's a whole other thing to be truly convinced and to stand to put all your weight on that tightrope. How did Abraham demonstrate that faith? Obedience. Where Adam and Eve disobeyed, Abraham obeyed. God said, go. Abraham went. Jesus came and called his disciples and he said, follow me. And the disciples followed. Abraham acted on his faith and it produced a change in direction. Before his calling, we don't know anything about Abraham. We don't know anything about Abraham before his calling. And you know what? It didn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because once God calls Abraham, he is born again. He's a new person. Abraham believed the promise. He acted on his faith. He saw the power of God. He traveled to Canaan. God showed him the land as far as his eye could see. And eventually, Abraham and his second wife had six more sons. Was he superhuman? No. Was he perfect? No. Was he otherworldly? No. He was a farmer. He was a rancher. And his life changed forever because he obeyed. Faith plus obedience equals a changed life. That's what verse 18 refers to. Paul says, In hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. All those years of continuing to believe God's promises, despite the fact that he and Sarah were past childbearing years, despite the fact that they still hadn't seen a child, when anybody else would have given up, when anybody else would have thrown in the towel, the promise that God would make him into a great nation, when Abraham was 75 years old, living in a land of idolatry, and then God makes the promise, and then he and Sarah wait another 25 years before that promise is fulfilled just to leave everything behind, to leave everyone behind, to go and camp and to live in a foreign land, that takes faith. And to believe that one day your elderly body would not just have one kid, but many, takes faith. And that if in that time he and Sarah had ever stopped believing, then all of it would have come crashing down. But because he kept believing and he kept obeying, he continued as a stranger in a strange land because he believed, ultimately, one day, God is going to do the impossible. Verse 19 emphasizes that great faith that Abraham had throughout the years. Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the bareness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. What kind of faith does Paul mention here? He says, no unbelief made him waver. That means obedient faith. There it is. Obedient faith. Remember, not perfect faith. Abraham and Sarah made plenty of mistakes. Nobody is asking you to be perfect. And not works. Remember, we are saved by grace. And it, it, it was Abraham's works and Sarah's works that got them into trouble. But obedient faith is the one that believes the promises of God and then changes direction. That is why Paul puts Abraham on the stand. In a time before law, in a time before circumcision, before baptism, before a written Bible, Abraham believed God, he obeyed, and God said, that is righteousness. 
I want to remind you of a parable that Jesus told in Matthew 21. Uh, we'll read that and then uh, we'll, we'll close. Matthew 21, Jesus says, What do you think? A man had two sons. What man had two sons? Abraham, right? And he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? And they said, the first. Jesus asks, who does the will of the father? And the crowd responds, who? The one who obeyed. The one who follows is the one who obeys. The one who does God's will is the one who obeys. Listen, it's not about who can write the best statement of faith, and it's not about which church has the most right doctrine, and it's not the, about who says the longest prayers. Followers of Jesus obey. We talked about Jesus' promises to us. Our promise is John 3.16. What about our calling? Do we have a calling? We do. We said each Christian is called. Our calling is found in Matthew 28. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Jesus says, make disciples in every nation, baptize them in a Trinitarian God, and emphasize the importance of works. <laughs> no, obedience. The faith that saved Abraham, that was credited to him as righteousness, was not works. It was an obedience to his calling. And the faith that saves us is not an agreement that we, you know, agree about all the facts about Jesus or, or church membership or, or any sort of knowledge. The faith that saves us is the belief in God's promise, that same faith that Abraham had. Romans 4.23, still talking about Abraham. Now not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. The same kind of faith that saved Abraham saves us. Paul says, only now for you, the Christian, the object of your faith, is Jesus. What should a Christian do today? Trust in the promises of Jesus and change direction. Trust in the promises of Jesus and follow. That statement, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, was written as much for our sake today so that we would know the same God who makes Abraham righteous, makes us righteous. It's that same faith, the same faith in a great God who can do the impossible. Because a God who can give an elderly couple a family is the same God that raises Jesus from the dead. And then Paul sums up his case with this amazing a uh, summary of the Christian faith in verse 25. He says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. That is our original promise come true. That's John 3.16 coming true. That's our promise fulfilled. Jesus was handed over to the cross. He paid the penalty of our sin. He was raised from the dead to take away our sin. Eternal life is guaranteed to you because sin is paid for. And Jesus was raised from the dead. It's another amazing impossible promise, right? That one day you also will be raised from the dead. Yes, it's the faith that saves. It's, it's our faith that gives us a right standing with God. We're, we are each one saved by grace, not works, absolutely nothing's changed. But as Paul argues, faith 
will also produce a change in your direction. Faith produces belief, and believers follow. When God calls you, you won't be content to stay in the land of your fathers. And God's call in your life will take you to new places. Yes, perhaps even places of trial, places of temptation. And no, it will not be easy. But the goal of your life is not to have an easy life. The goal of your life is righteousness. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these words, these reminders that obedient Christians follow. We hear the blessing. We receive the calling that's on our life. We pick up our mat and follow. We drop our nets and we follow. May each day of our lives be about following our Messiah, our Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Thank you for his perfect life, for all that he gives each one here. And if any one of us is going through a time where we feel low or doubt or frustrated, or that you aren't answering prayers, or that there is just some roadblock in our way, Lord, continue to give us faith. As the disciples begged, Lord, increase our faith. May we love you and follow you each day of our life and believe the impossible and believe that you can do the impossible through us and through your church. Amen. Well, we want to thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. Of course, you can always clip and copy the address up there and you can post that link to your own social media wall. Let other people know what you listened to this morning. And of course, we would love to have you here with us, to be here in church with us, to sit with brothers and sisters in Christ. We have two services every Sunday, one at 930. That's our traditional service. We've got a choir. We're going to sing hymns out of the hymnal. We're going to do responsive readings, say the Lord's Prayer, have communion. It's going to be just like the church that you grew up in. And then our 11 o'clock service is our contemporary service. We have a worship team, come casual, come however you feel the most comfortable, and bring your kids. We've got a full program from birth all the way through high school, and we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.